Hello and welcome to this special episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. I'm your sauna mayor Janne Kauhanen and today I'm joined on the sofa by with Secure Chief Research Officer Mikko Hyppönen and our Chief Information Security Officer Erka Koivunen. We're going to be talking about what was quite a unique case, the 2020 hack of the Finnish psychotherapy center Vastaamo and the subsequent leaking of patient data and ransomware notices. The story broke the news again last week when the Finnish police issued an arrest warrant for a 25-year-old Finnish su- su- subject named in the uh, arrest warrant. Vastam system administration's neglect prior to the incident has also been called into a question, which has led some to make the opinion that this was a preventable incident. So, yeah. gentlemen, what's this case all about? It's the single biggest crime in the history of Finland, in the history of our country, when you look at the number of victims. A totally unusual case in many ways, not just because of the target of the breach, but the amount of victims, the way the attacker tried to make money out of it, and also unique in the sense that the company which was hit by this breach actually went bankrupt because of the breach. And something to tell about the size of the, the number of the victims the police online criminal complaint site went down when people were trying to report that incident. Okay. So five and a half million people living here in Finland, it was it 22,000 police reports or crime reports left to the police about this crime, which is, I mean, there That's are- That's historical in itself. It's yeah. historical and it's it's hard to imagine a crime of this scale that could be done anywhere else except online. See, this is one of the things that internet has changed. We can now have crimes of massive scale. This would have been impossible without the internet. Sure. But, but in a nutshell, it's a company which was running a psychotherapy center where the unique selling point was that it was very high tech and they were doing everything online and, and, and everything. The information about the patients was in a cutting edge database they built by themselves. Unfortunately, they didn't secure it very well. And the database, including the notes kept by the psychotherapist for the sessions they did with the patients, was hacked at least twice. And the company was experiencing tremendous growth, which we all know translates to gaining technical debt. And of course, they were struggling to keep that system up and running. So the sysadmins had enabled remote access to that server. And it turns out that the remote access was not, was not only for them, but 7 billion other human beings on this planet. So the last known breach of the database was in 2019, but then nothing happened for a year. This became public in September 2020, which is when the attacker, who then called himself with the nickname Ransom Man, started posting information about the victims on a website he had set up in the Tor Hidden Service, and he announced this to the world through Reddit and through Finnish language forums, where he informed the media and the victims and everyone else that this breach has happened and that he has been already ransoming the company. And now he wants to put the pressure on the company by publishing part of the information. Mm. The information here being like patient records, all that stuff. Yeah, he was kind of a releasing 100 records mm. per day and the plan was to build up pressure until on a was it the third or fourth day when he accidentally blurted out the whole database yep somewhere between the third and fourth day he managed to do a mistake while posting information on his store hidden server and he accidentally posted a file which was basically a backup of his attack server. So it included the full patient database because it was stored on the server itself. So he leaked the, the crown jewels, the things he was trying to make money with and the most destructive part of the information. But he also managed to leak, I mean, backup of his own server. Mm. Source code, SSH keys, links to other servers, material, um, and and and... We've investigated here at WitSecure like so many cases. There's practically never a case where you have so much evidence. Like you, you like during the investigation, the the hacker manages to leak his own server, which uh, has been, of course, a goldmine for the law enforcement and provides tons of links to other services that the attacker was using. However, no smoking gun. There was nothing really obvious on this site itself. Not even obvious to 
to where in the world the attacker is coming from. Um, since the victims were all Finns and the site was Finnish, uh, it was always suspected that the attacker might be a Finn as well. And you would think that if a Finnish hacker server is confiscated and you look through all the files and the notes and the source code comments, you would find swear word in Finnish or mm. something. Uh, nothing, nothing that obvious, but tons of information to go through. And, well, for the last two years, the law enforcement has been coming through the information and most likely information from the other servers linked from this uh, original server as well. And and it's been a lot of work for them. No, I'm sure it has. The to me the disturbing thing about this incident was was well first of all we're talking about personal people like very private information like discussions with your therapist like what what would be more private than that, but also this guy was going after each victim personally. He was ransoming not only the company but like these victims himself. Yeah, and uh, who, what kind of person even thinks that I'm not I'm unable to ex extract money from this company mm. by pressurizing the CEO. Mm. Let's then turn to the patients who are themselves already a victim. So that that was quite bold and that created something of a large scandal here in the domestic news media as well. And uh, some people wanted to pay for the silence, for the privilege of not having mm. this, this information being published um, and uh, the the bitcoin exchange service mm. that the, the uh, ransom man had instructed people to to use quickly stopped these money transactions okay yeah so i guess the the perpetrator ended up with cashing a few thousand euros few thousand dollars mm. at the time the amount of money he was asking from from the individual victims to prevent their files from being leaked publicly was 200 euros. Yeah. Uh, and if you didn't pay in time, then you would have to pay 500 euros to yeah. prevent it. So a little, the money figure he was trying to get from each victim wasn't wasn't very large. Um, some victims did successfully pay. Um, the the attacker himself was uh, recommending to use this Bitti Raha service, which is the biggest exchange here in Finland. But you, of course, it's Bitcoin. You can pay through any service. Sure. And I spoke with victims uh, who had paid the ransom, had used Binance or other services, or people who were more familiar with, with Bitcoin. And I spoke with a lot of victims who wanted to pay, but were unable. To. They couldn't figure mm, it out right. in time. They don't know how it all works. They 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 tried using the Bitti Raha service, but the money was returned back to them. So... Nevertheless, the, the actual concrete amount of money the the attacker was able to walk away with was a few thousand euros. Yeah, yeah. This crime didn't pay off. No, no. The damage was million times larger than the money yeah. made from it. But and it, the obviously the data has now been leaked and it's anyway, yeah. still there. It's impossible to ever get it off. Yeah, although we don't know for a fact how exactly the full database leaked. We, we know that ransom man leaked it. By accident, mm. but then a few months later, the, the database was leaked as a whole without any of the extra files which were on the backup, mm. um, and also a, a little bit le in a reformatted way on a different Tor hidden service site. Mm. Now that could have been Ransomman himself, or it could have been someone else yeah, who it downloaded was the file. Searchable user in the face, mm. and uh, if you compare the the print out that the psychotherapy company had given to the victims mm. and the output that this service had, the the criminal service had a nicer user interface and the format of the report of your data was much more fancy. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. But, but, but we don't know no. if that's the original attacker or if it's someone else who just wants to hurt people for some other reason. We, we don't right. really know that for a fact. What we do know is that the amount of victims and the amount of data In, in all of these leaks is the same, 31,980 records in the database. Mm. And almost all of them are real people, including children. We have to re keep in mind mm. just how horrible this is, that there are small children who've been at the psychotherapist um, for very serious reasons. Mm. And the notes of those sessions are also part of the published information. And, so, and by, by the way, the, the authorities, they instruct that the psychotherapy notes should be quite brief and focused on kind of a follow-up to, to facilitate the follow-up of future sessions and to, to kind of uh, monitor the progress of your healing. 
but if you're in a hurry and you have a nice user interface that you can simply type in the meeting minutes right after the session, mm. you probably are just blurting out whatever recollections you have and you don't have time to edit it for brevity. So depending on the case, depending on the individual therapist, you might have actually extremely sensitive information there. But more of it, yeah. But you should not. You should yeah. expect as a patient that you have only kind of superficial brief notes about how you are progressing. Mm. Okay. Let me let me just add on that that that's right. But we do have to remember that the therapists themselves are also victims right. in this data breach. This is not their fault. They did nothing wrong to, to to cause this data to leak. And of course, many of them are traumatized by what happened here. I mean, the mm. information, they know just how 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 critical the information is. That And the fact that their notes are now out in the public is, yeah. is it's horrible. So, but we're talking about this case right now because last week the events took a turn when the Finnish police uh, issued an arrest warrant for a suspect that they sort of like for this case. Um, what do we know about the suspect and his history? Yep. There's an international arrest warrant. The whereabouts of the suspect, Mr. Julius Kivimäki, are unknown at the time. He's most likely somewhere in Europe. And he has a 10-year history of, of various hacks. He started as very young. He was hanging around with internationally known hacking groups like uh, HTP or, or Lizard Squad was running botnets, has been launching denial of attacks against various services, including high-profile targets like the Sony PlayStation Network. Mm. He's been uh, involved, allegedly, I guess, in in swatting incidents, calling cops on his enemies or pretending to be his enemy and do something that the cops will raid their homes. And in at least two cases where he's made bomb threats on airplanes, which have then been met with fighter jets and escorted to do emergency landings, to search for bombs which are not on the planes in order to cause hassle for mm-hmm. some key people who happen to be on those planes. So highly unusual individual who has been active in the online underground for quite a while. Quite unusual for a Finnish hacker. We we don't have cases like this usually. No, I remember the, the Lizard Squad incident where this Finnish guy was appearing on BBC talking about the attacks. Sky News, actually. Sky News, sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I understand, Mikko, you've met the guy. That's true. I've actually met him um, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, when he was very young. He actually applied for a trainee position. And he was a minor at the time. He was a minor at the time. So he, he was applying for a trainee position with the company, which which I, I didn't give him. But yeah, I've, I've met him. And, and uh, this is, it's it's, of course, hard for me to think if something would have been different if mm. we would have hired him and somehow been able to turn him around and 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 you know make somehow change the history but that didn't happen and of course right now well it's it's sad to see that someone with skills has gone to the dark side so i do want to talk about the, you know why this happens why people go to the dark side but let's uh, first talk a little bit about um, you know vastam of the company uh, you said that the the therapists themselves are victims here as well. But what about the comp- company? There is an opinion out there that this attack was, to a degree at least, preventable. Well, the database was out there in the open, and it had been for years. So Shodan already had listed it, and it turns out that the database didn't have a password. So the root account was there out for grabs. So you could say that you could do a bit better job in protecting <laughs> yes. that system. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I used to think that medical information is is not the main target for online criminals. Um, people have been worried about security of medical devices and medical databases, medical information for a very long time. And I've always like answered questions around this that, yeah, sure, it, it feels bad when medical information is, is stolen, but it's not the main target because the financial information is so much more valuable. Attackers mm-hmm. want to gain access to credit card numbers and bank accounts. They want money. But a- attacks like this show that you can actually make money with medical information. In this case, it wasn't very successful, but the, the idea works very well. And there are so many different kinds of medical information. Most medical information is it might be embarrassing or something we consider very private. 
but it won't be very critical for very long. Like the information that I had to get something for an itch. Mm. Right now, it might be embarrassing. In 20 years, who cares? Mm. But psychotherapy notes will stay destructive for a very long time, explosive for a very long time, as mm. long as anyone mentioned in the notes is, is alive, basically. Right. And that's a very long time mm. to secure data, but still keep it accessible mm. if it needs to be accessible. And that is one of the big challenges we face. And here, the company clearly wasn't equipped to handle that responsibility. And the company actually had voluntarily asked for the supervisory authorities to audit the system. They wanted it to be cleared so that it would be then integrated in the national patient's data records system. And the authorities just had denied that application, which effectively meant that there was no regulatory reason or requirement to subject the the company's information systems to security audits. Mm. And obviously, it seems that they didn't then do that. Mm. And the sysadmins who then were responsible of exposing that system to the internet, they had had a criminal uh, uh, investigation on their behalf uh, or, and on, about their participation and contribution to the events and the, their charges have since been lifted. Okay. So they have been kind of exempted. But uh, you could say that they, they have been working in an impossible situation since mm. obviously the system was falling apart, the company was growing, everybody was in a hurry, and too mu- not too much was invested in, in uh, fixing these technical debts and uh, securing the system. And it could be said that the company should have known that uh, the, the systems had been breached at least twice already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The uh, subsequent forensics report that has not been made public as such, but has been referenced in court documents, refers that the first breach probably took place in 2018. Mm. The second breach took place in 2019 and the attacker not only copied the contents, but also uh, caused the database to crash. Mm. So obviously the company knew something was off. And there was even a note found Mm. on the server. But it's now questionable whether anybody found that note at the time. So there would have been many places, the regulatory requirements or the investigations to incidents and anomalies that should have prompted a proper properly functioning company to step up their security. And uh, yet they didn't. And that led to even more complicated situation because there was an acquisition. The company Mm. was being bought and the new investors, when they were doing the due diligence, they were not hinted at all that there would be something of a problem brewing up. Okay. Lots of missed opportunities. Mm. So, yeah, so there's a b- bunch of stuff to unpack here on, in terms of what could have been done to prevent this. Uh, you mentioned the regulators, for one thing, then just uh, basic cyber hygiene, I guess. Um, uh, looking at your critical, sort of your, you know, your psychotherapy center, what's more critical than the patient data? That's got to be your ground jewel. And then mm. also these missed opportunities in the actual inv- incident investigations yeah. when when stuff is weird, weird stuff is happening in your system and it's assumably being investigated, mm. but sort of maybe not deep enough or. Yeah, and, and the system architecture obviously was just a place to store blobs of data mm. and all the patient data appears to have been easily accessible without encryption. So a proper modern system would have uh, separated uh, the, the data and the identities of people under separate pseudonyms, but obviously this was in-house system. Wasn't it even so that the founder and the CEO of the company had written the first lines of code? So, so the the investments that would have been needed to secure a system like this simply were not done. They didn't 
really fully understand the value of the data they were holding. Otherwise, they probably would have realized that they have to put more investment and more resources to, to secure this database and to monitor for anomalies. The fact that they had multiple anomalies in the system and didn't really react based on that re- tells us that they really weren't looking. So it is it is a, the, the all too common story where the first time a company puts a money figure on the data they hold is when they get asked for a ransom for the data. Right. So right. a ransom man comes over, I want half a million for this data. Then they have to decide, like, is our is data worth, worth half a million or is it not? Okay. And uh, the, uh, if I understood correctly, the, the founder who sold the company to the investment company, he has since been ordered by the court to return the money. And of, obviously, some of the money had already been spent on yachts and mansion. Mm. So they are now confiscated. So the sea is about to freeze yeah. soon. So I don't know who is actually going to lift that boat from the <laughs> ice. <Yeah>. Always the <laughs> pragmatist. Um, so, okay. So let's get back to sort of what we know about the suspect, maybe less about him and more about the youth in general. Um, you know, what drives someone to the dark side? What drives young people to join street gangs? What drives people to be fascinated by by crime? It's the feeling of togetherness, camaraderie, that mm. they, they feel some kind of friendship and support among the people they happen to somehow find themselves with. Uh, excitement. Mm. It's exciting to, you know, roam the street in the middle of the night or roam the internet in the middle of the night with your friends doing evil stuff um, like they might have seen in the movies. And of course, if you start very young, that's probably how it feels like. And it's partially just for fun, for the lulls, like they say. Like, like why would someone launch a denial of service attack against Sony PlayStation Network on the Christmas day when all the Kids around the world have just received their brand new PlayStation. Well, you do it for no reason. You do it because it's it's fun to cause chaos. And and then you go on the record for on Sky News saying that we did it. Why would yeah. you ever do that? There's no logic. So the reason is there sometimes simply is no logic. Yeah, but, you but, need to kind of turn off the empathy part of it. Well, your that's brain. my question, because mm. like all of us, we we grew up hanging out in, in bulletin board systems and and you know there but for the grace of god go we but we didn't turn bad we didn't turn to a life of crime so you know is it it's easy to say that you know it seems like there's something morally wrong with an individual like this do you think that's a fair assessment does there have to be something wrong in you for you to turn to stuff like this i don't want to speculate on that i'm not a psychologist myself right. i don't know what's wrong with people who go into life of crime all i know is that it's not some it, it's not always that simple yeah um, it, it's it's easy to say that people you know with the skills but without the opportunities then find the opportunities by breaking the law but for a, a young clever person growing up in in the capital of finland there's plenty of opportunities if right. you really choose to do the right thing um, so it's it's not that simple. I don't really know. And, and sometimes we just can't explain all these things. True. But it, it's fair to say that uh, young male, they are kind of uh, overrepresented in these kinds of crime. And uh, it, it, they kind of seem, seem to cherish this tech bro approach where you don't actually care at all of mm. the victims and you're kind of uh, doing it for the lulls. Then people grow up, they become older and they develop some sense of mm. empathy. Uh, you could argue that we <clears throat> we might even have a person who might not have developed that empathy over time. So mm. there's always some sociopathic element amongst us and they, of course, become criminal uh, carrier criminals. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't know have enough information to de- determine whether this is the case right, now. Right. Uh, but it is difficult to to imagine 
pure financial motivation mm. for this. Yeah, there yeah. was an attempt to to at least portray this as a as a money extracting scheme, mm. but everything that happened in the Vastamo case suggests that this was actually a, a person flying on the wire trying to ad hoc yeah and uh, and uh, kind of ad lib uh, what they were doing and kind of uh, not thinking through how to actually execute that mm, mm. crime so it might be that there was this sense of excitement that was actually driving the disconnect from the victim's pain and then an attempt at making some bug but that's maybe that's sort of my question you're sort of making it sound like this guy was wading in too deep and n- maybe not so much in this case but what i'm wondering is is that do we see that happening where somebody is like interested in computer things doing things trying things out and then you know just wanders a little bit too far a little bit off the reservation mm. like do, st- does stuff like that happen i don't know i don't know and I, like i said we can't always explain what right. what, what the h- how the route ended up here but so, it's it, it's i mean we have so many people online of course we will have the 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 exceptions and one of the exceptions we have here mm-hmm. is, is is right this but can we save some of these people like can we save some of these youth um you know there's been all these coding schools popping up all over the place should we have a, a hacking school that maybe not doesn't teach people how to hack but teaches people how to hack ethically well one thing i've loved is is bug bounties mm. like, like bug bounties open the door for people who have this great itch to hack and to break security and show that they can break in and they can do it legally mm. because bug bounties enable that like we we run a bug bounty you can right. hack us and if you hack us we will pay you money for it as long as you tell us what you did and instead of posting it publicly or leaking data right. or any of that and that's that's a great way i'm sure we are saving people on the whole because of these things we've we've developed like like we the industry together but we can't save them all mm. uh, one obvious thing is that these are typically computer crimes are of the type that will never get resolved and mm. many people just get away without being caught so anything that can be done to increase the likelihood that you actually would be caught and in reasonable time not in right yeah several year span that that would that would um at least uh play for the fear of getting caught factor well let's hope this case is one of those where where the uh, the guilty party eventually gets caught and convicted but what other than that like what are the the ramifications of this case for the sort of information security industry in general well the first thing we have to mention here is that we have to give congratulations to law enforcement for actually being able to name a suspect yeah. and hopefully we have the right suspect hopefully this will go to court hopefully we will have a sentence um so that's a great achievement mm-hmm. actually most c- online crime cases never reach this far this is an exception and there's been a lot of work done not just at the law enforcement but especially at the law enforcement mm. to get this far and that's that's really great um the other future ramifications well the, the the sad part is that this probably won't be the last case where medical information is used to extract money from the patients we've seen over the last two years multiple cases of of medical systems being targeted with ransomware and denial of service attacks for ransom and other kinds of uh, blackmailing attempts um we haven't seen too many cases where the patients would be targeted but we have seen that as well interestingly enough many of the cases where um patient data is used to get money from the patients themselves have been around hacking of um uh, uh, plastic surgery clinics mm. which is a totally different story it's also bad but not as bad as psychotherapy notes mm. but that's that's the down downside we might see more attacks following the template we saw in Vastam mm. I think uh, one thing also worth understanding is that this appears to have been an opportunistic crime. So the story goes that the the attacker uh, downloaded the database in 2019 and it took the perpetrator one year to figure out how to exploit that information. Mm. That spells that there are bound to be a number of individual criminals or even professional criminals that 
are utilizing these script kitty tools and attack tools. They are sucking in all the data that they can possibly download, and there will be long aftermarket for that data. So you you might even find a long tail of consequences if you fail to protect your business. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that the company Vastamu was confident that they they got off hook, that the data was stolen, but nothing happened. Mm. Two years later, it comes back to bite them. We don't know exactly how this happened, but one theory which would explain this delay is that a completely unrelated attacker stole the database. It was floating around somewhere in the underground. Nobody really knew what it was. And then finally, it found its hands into someone who spoke the language and could mm. actually read the notes and understand just how valuable the information is. For that, you really have to read the language and understand what it is. Mm. Um, maybe that's the backstory. We don't really know that, but yeah. it could be. Okay, so for the members of our audience who are just now hearing about this incident or want to find out more, uh, a lot has been written about this in, in media in Finland and in different countries. But Mikko, I understand you also kept a, sort of a journal during the time when this was happening. Yeah, I, I was keeping a diary while I was investigating the case back then in 2020, which I actually added into my book. And I've published the chapter from my book, which talks about the case Vastamo on, on the website, which is the website for the book. If it's smart, it's vulnerable.com. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. And thank Thanks. you for our audience for tuning in.